that is that is absolutely incredible. That that's that's the church bell of Ringle Methodist Church, not just the one that you've seen every time you come in, but the one that was originally in that original church building. We're 175 years old this year. That church bell was put in the original church structure in 1857. It's so important. These are critical moments. Let's look back, celebrate 175 years, incredible. And through that, see ahead. Embrace the exciting potential and deal realistically with the challenges. Let's see ahead together. All right, again, I'm Chris Bryant, Senior Pastor here. Thank you so much for joining us in person. I'm so glad that you are here today. And thank you as well for joining us online. We appreciate it. Um, listen, if uh, you're on TikTok, if that's one of your social apps, I want to encourage you today. And I know that's just a portion of the demographic represented in the church. Nonetheless, if that's you, I invite you to do a video sometime today, maybe even in worship right now. You're welcome to do it of me. And just share on TikTok with those that follow you that faith, worship, church is a part of your life. All right, 175 years old and counting, and counting, right? That's part of what we're here to talk about. That's part of what we're celebrating. It's not just the great things God has done in the past, but together we're seeing ahead. And, and today we're thinking about specifically 13 years ahead. 13 years ago, this new wing, what we consider the new wing, which in, uh, includes the lobby out front and all the way down that hallway, that uh, the administrative offices and the multi-purpose room, and of course, the preschool wing, all that was built 13 years ago. We were 13 years ago, they were just about ready to open it. Some of you were here for that. How different the church would be today if those then didn't make that decision, if those then didn't have the courage and the faith and the generosity to move forward, it'd be a completely different place. We're envisioning 13 years from now, what will the church be? 13 years from now, a child born today will be ready for what we call confirmation then. You know, confirmation, the time when each person has a chance that has been raised in the church to confirm their faith as their own. And the scripture that we read today from Jeremiah is often used in the context of confirmation. And if not confirmation, oftentimes just in youth ministry in general, sometimes it's quoted to high school seniors. The scripture we read today, of course, that ironically begins here with Jeremiah's call of, and he says that it, that, that it is in the 13th year of King, uh, uh, King Josiah, who uh, was one of the most beloved kings of, of Israel. And uh, of course, uh, he was a young king himself. He was about 21 years old at the time when, when this happened. And, and, and so we read these, these wonderful verses, how God says to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were even born. I knew you in your mother's womb. And I have this special calling for you and this special mission. And you're going to go where I say you to go and say what I say to say. And, and don't let anybody discourage you for your youth and for your young age. And, and so we think of all these things. And we say them on behalf of the Lord when we look at uh, the next confirmation class of 7th graders, 8th graders, sometimes freshmen in high school, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids. We say all these things on their behalf. And we say to them, God's got a future for you. And it, it, it's, a, it's a, a future to prosper you and not to harm you. It's a future with hope. And we tell them, this is God's promise for you. And this is God's blessing upon you if you'll take it seriously. And we invite you to do so. I mean, that's our invitation. I've, I've seen this sort of thing done all over and over and over again with confirmation students, which, which begs the question, what church will we be 13 years from now when children born today could be ready for such a blessing then? Will we be in a, will we be in a vibrant church, an exciting church? Will our missions and ministries continue to be dynamic? Will they be more so than they are today? Uh, will our worship be transformative for people that are engaging, whether in person or online? Do they feel themselves changed by the Spirit because they're participating in it? Will, 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 will our missions be effective? Will we continue to be adding new programs? And what will the building look like? Will it continue to be warm and inviting, maybe even more so? Will people still say that's the church that helps people? Or 13 years from now, will people say, well, yeah, that church used to help people? Or they say, yeah, that church way back when, way when we had a tornado, and that's all they can say because nothing had happened since. It's, it's important, right? We have to understand everything we do today affects the kind of church and people will be then. The first time I made a connection uh, between uh, baptizing a child and confirmation in my role was actually 18 years ago. I was on staff at Hillside Church under uh, Richard Hunter, senior pastor. He's now one of the, uh, he's now the senior pastor of one of the largest Methodist churches in Alabama. And 
you know, if, it's been a while we, with COVID. We haven't had uh, baptisms here, and so it's been a lot. But just in case, if I need to remind you, or maybe if you've never seen it before, uh, you know, in Methodist churches, when we baptize someone who is young or an infant, we always ask the mom, the dad, the godparents, if they are professing their faith in Jesus Christ, and, and we ask them if they will teach the child and lead the child in their own guidance, by their own words and actions, in their own example, and keep them under the influence of the church. We ask all these things, and then we turn to the congregation. We always do this as Methodists. We, we turn to the congregation, and we say, will you? And we begin a series of questions about, will the church support this child and this family? And ever since I've been a Methodist, all the way back as a teenager myself, I, I have participated in these baptisms. I've seen sometimes churches just read out of the hymnal the, the standard litany for such a response. And then other times churches uh, have their own version of those words. But 18 years ago under Richard Hunter at Hillside, I saw the connection like I'd never seen it before. I saw him take a child, still wet from the waters of baptism, and begin to walk up and down the sanctuary and say, will you, will you care for this child? Will you care for this family? Will you make sure that this child has an incredibly inviting, deeply personal nursery, nursery that, that's got wonderful things to look at and do and that, that people will tell, they can tell the moment they walk in that, that we love kids here and we'll take care of their precious ones. Will you be the kind of church that makes sure we have an active, involved children's ministry that's engaging and helps kids know that they are loved by God and uniquely made by God? And, and will you have a youth ministry that's dynamic? I mean, he just goes on and on. It was so personal. And for the first time in my life, I really connected the moment of a child's baptism and what might happen 13 years later that that child would come to accept for themselves the family name that they were given at that baptism, the name Christian, and the family inheritance that they are offered and provided at that time, Christ himself. The connection between that baptism and what they might do, that, those 13 years later in affirming for themselves that very family and faith that is now theirs in my role as a normal, everyday person that happened to be there as part of the church family. It was a powerful connection for me. 13 years ago, we were in a water crisis. Remember that? 13 years ago, we were in a drought in Georgia. I remember this, I went, I went back and I looked at my notes and looked at uh, some of the, the sermons I was preaching, the communications that I had at the time, and, and the little church that I was in, it was a brand new baby church that I had started, over just over a year old, and, and, and we were praying for rain 13 years ago, it was a drought, Govern, then Governor uh, Purdue would get on TV every so many days and talk about Lake Lanier and its levels and how dangerous it was becoming, and we were debating over exactly what to do about it. And as people of faith, we were praying for rain. And we were saying, God, we're going to be so thankful when it rains. And, and, and we were making promises. We were saying, you know, never again are we going to take it for granted, this rain. Never again are we going to complain when it rains too much. No, we'll never, ever, ever do that again because we need the rain so badly. Do you remember? That was 13 years ago. 13 years ago, I, had, I was a father of two then, not three. I had a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And again, I started a church that was barely a year old. And I was deeply troubled that I was a failure. I was deeply concerned that I was disappointing the people that had invested me and believed in me and put me in charge of this, this adventure of starting a new church. I was deeply disappointed that I was, uh, or I was afraid that I would be disappointing the conference that had invested money in me and other people had stood behind me and said, yes, they affirmed this call in my life. I went back and I uh, looked at my, again, my communications. And uh, at that time, 13 years ago, this little church that, that I had started was at that point, we had about 100 people in that makeshift sanctuary that we did our best with every week, making it into a sanctuary from a school cafeteria. And we actually had about 60, we had about 60 in the children's ministry at the time from K through sixth grade, which is phenomenal, actually, now that I think about it. And it's funny how you go back and you look and you, and you see things differently, don't you? But I was so concerned because we hadn't started a second service. I was worried. Gosh, will we, will we never grow beyond this? I mean, it's taken so much work just to have what we have. And and, and, and then we were talking about a second Christmas Eve service. And I was like, will anybody show up? Oh, my gosh, it'll just all blow up. This is when it all just comes apart, isn't it? You know, it took another nine months. We ended up starting a second service. And it struggled for a bit. But eventually, we made some changes, and it took off. And, and two years after that, we started a third service. And two years after that, we began experimenting and talking about a fourth service. All that to say, friends, uh, to illustrate how from any given vantage point, it can be difficult to see the promised future that God has for us. 
from any given vantage point, it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to see the hope ahead, even if in fact that is exactly what's going to happen. Where were you 13 years ago? What fears did you have? What anxieties were you living through 13 years ago? What, 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 did, what tragedies did you face? We turn to Jeremiah 29, and probably the most famous verse in that entire book is verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future with hope. We turn to that passage over and over and over again. It's probably the most famous, most quoted passage. And yet rarely do we understand its context. This hope-filled, amazing passage, this promise and blessing that we claim is said by Jeremiah right before the worst event in the entire history of the Bible. In the Old Testament, in, in Israel. This is right before the entire, this is before the, the nation of Judah is dispersed, is destroyed. Jerusalem burned, the temple the, uh, burned, the, the, the Davidic monarchy done away with for all practical purposes. The worst they ever feared came true. And right before it, Jeremiah makes this promise. And he does other things in his ministry as well as he proclaims that judgment is coming. And he, he wants the people to see beyond the judgment. He wants to see people beyond and say, no, there's still hope. God is not going to abandon us. Hang on. Walk it through. This promise that we have, this incredible blessing from God, it is not a happy-go-lucky thing. It's not, oh, yeah, uh, uh, God has promised for you for the future, and, and uh, it, uh, it, you know, nothing ever bad is going to happen. And it, it, no, it's not nearly that whims whimsical. It's a promise. It's a, an assuredness of who we are as God's people, of God's intentions for us, an invitation as such, to then respond with obedience, to somehow see through whatever anxiety and fears we have, to see beyond the difficulty that we're in, and then to see some way this promise of hope, and in so act accordingly, begin acting towards it. 13 years ago, as I said, I was facing challenges and the fear of disappointing those around me, and yet I was able to see just enough of God's preferred future for me, to, by faith, with the eyes of faith, to, to, to believe in it just enough to act accordingly, to act towards it. And so we did. We, we did things. We gave leadership. And, and sometimes the ideas that we had, it didn't work at all. It just kind of was like, well, that just didn't work. And then other times, things that we weren't so sure about it worked 300 times better than we imagined. And everything in between. But how important it is that we step forward Remember that hope is not just wishful thinking. We talked about this all through August. True hope, godly hope, always prompts you forward. A few months back, right as this pandemic was starting, your church decided to take a step of faith. and We brought the property next door. I thought I'd show it to you again, just in case you'd forgotten about this or you uh, didn't hear about it the first time. So this church is landlocked, and in and, and the beginning of the new year, we had an opportunity to buy this property that is adjacent to ours, and... And so quickly we did the math and we came up with possible scenarios and we, we followed the book of discipline as far as how we're uh, to approach these things. And, and at the end of the day, after we finished our process and due diligence, we said, yeah, this is a good thing. Let's buy this. Let's go forward. We can do this. And we had come up with over two dozen ideas of what this property could be used for. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we have no idea. We're waiting, but, but we, we can see enough of the future, even though there's always, it, it seems like it's never a right time, right? It's almost never a right time. Nonetheless, we can see enough of God's prepared future to look through the difficulties and the challenges of today, look beyond what we face currently, and see enough of God's prepared future to act towards what we're seeing until we bought the property. Now, this doesn't mean that God's future for us means that we always say yes to things. Sometimes the answer is no. But the best no's in the world are always because you're thinking about some other yes. And that's especially true as a church. There's nothing wrong with saying no. Sometimes we need to. But the best no's are never because for, for the no themselves, like we just don't want to do this or we're too scared. No, that's not. A, but a, a good no is we say no to this because we want to say yes to this other thing. In this case, we were able to just straightforwardly say yes. Now, when the pandemic, and this happened right up, right before COVID-19 really took hold. And I even asked your church council, I said, you guys, may, let's just make sure. We already had a vote, but I said, let's just give opportunity again. And everybody affirmed it. So we don't need to vote again. This is, we're moving forward. Wow. 
You know, when I first came here and give, was given a tour of these facilities, I was taken upstairs, and I thought I would show you the upstairs just in case you'd never seen it. Above the new wing, this, this empty space, this unfinished space, it's just been there. It's been there for 13 years. And it's a, quite a metaphor that we have all the space above the, the new wing where we could build. What, what could be there? I don't know. All sorts of ideas, all sorts of things. What a metaphor for the future. Empty space. What could be? Where is God calling us? What might we do? Where might we go? What a powerful metaphor for what the future may hold and our, our part in that, to choose today to act towards it. What a powerful metaphor as well for the empty space in people's lives where church and Jesus should be. Thank you for that. We can thank you. You know, these candles that I, I lit right before I started the sermon, they represent the entire population, 100% of our culture. And what I thought I would share with you today is that this first candle here might represent 20%, one-fifth of our culture that the church right now, and I mean church, not just this one, but all churches, church in general, seemingly interacts with. Christianity today interacts with about 20% of the people in our world, or in our culture, rather. And around somewhere between 11 to 14% of those people attend. Maybe not every week, but they're involved, they're connected. They, they may be a member, they may not, but there is a connection there. There is some level of involvement with church. Normally when we do outreach and evangelism, you know the people that we end up reaching, the end up that we try to bring in, is the other 6 to 9% that's in this group. This first 20% is typically the only group of the population, the only part of our culture the church today reaches. Then you have another group, another slice of 20%. These folks, they say <clears throat> that they'd be willing to come. Uh, they, they may have a little bit of faith in their background. Maybe, maybe they went to church as a child. And oftentimes they say, you know, if somebody personally invited me, I'll go. And what the evidence suggests is they do. If they get invited, they go, but they don't stay. Something about the way church is in most places and most people and with most people, it just doesn't connect with them. They don't get it. They don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to them. And so they leave. And we don't reach that group of people. And then there's this other 20% of the population who, like that other one, they say they too would be invited, or if they would too would come to a church, they would check it out if invited, but they don't ever come. That's a lie for these groups, for this, for this group. They, they are so disconnected and so disappointed and so, so just absolutely just do not relate it at all to how the church is today, even if they're invited. Even though they say they'll come, they won't. We're not reaching or talking to them at all. And then you got this last group of folks. There's 40% of these people. 40% of the culture consists of this group. And these folks, they are so far from Christianity and the church, well, the church might as well be invisible. In fact, it is. I mean, the, the most they ever think of church is every once in a while they might recognize that a church building looks a little different than the other buildings. But even then... It's really almost not noticeable. And not only is that true, but social evidence continues to point to not only is that true, but we as the church, those of us that are involved with church, we don't see them either. They're so different and so far away and so far out, we can't even imagine how they think or how they feel. So we're not reaching them. And so where are we going to be in 13 years? Where are we going to be? How's this? And, and some people right now might be thinking, well, that's probably the way it's always been, right? I mean, isn't that the way things are? Actually, no. And I'm going to share more with you next week about how it's actually gotten worse, a lot worse in the last 10 years alone. But what do we do? How do we embrace a future with hope? How do we see through the challenges of today, the difficulties that we're living through, and begin to believe in a hope what do we, and, and act towards that? What does that look like? Well, for some people right now, you're thinking this is where the pastor tells us that everything we're, doing wrong, everything we're doing is wrong and bad and we should just do all these different things. 
And actually, no, I think the very first step is doing some of the things that we've always done, but doing them a lot better. To be real about that, to have difficult conversations as we need to, to strive for excellence, to recognize that, that yeah, the way we do things, the way we do things right now, a lot of the stuff we do, it is connecting with people. And there's still people that we need to reach in this group. And so we need to do some of the things we're doing right now, but we need to get a lot better at it because we need to reach people there. But that's not enough. It also means because there are some people who will come and they will maybe try it out and check out faith and church, and, but ultimately they fall away. That means that we need to not just do some of the things that we've done and do them better, but do some of the things that we've always done because they relate to this. They'll, they'll come but then do them differently, so they stay. We need to do some of the things we've always done, but begin to change. And you've told me this. People in this church have told me this. You've, you've said yourself, missions and ministries that we have gotten used to over the years, over time, has to change. I mean, the people that say that they want to do church like they've always done it, right? How long do they last? It's only a matter of time before there's fewer and fewer and fewer doing some of what we've always done, but then beginning to change it because you can't keep doing things even as you used to do them. And then to reach other folks, folks that, that <laughs> you know, they say they'd come, but they'll never walk through because they just don't relate at all. That means not only do we have to do some of the things that we've already done and do it better and do some of the things we've done differently, we're going to have to do some brand new stuff. We're going to have to be willing to start ministries and do kinds of uh, expressions of Christian faith that we haven't thought of yet, that we're not used to. It might be strange and foreign to us. We're going to have to do that to reach that group. And then finally, how in the world are we going to reach the 40% that are practically invisible? Well, here's one thought. I think to reach folks like this, it's not just doing things that maybe we've never done. I think to reach people in this category means that we're going to have to be willing to do something that right up until the point of that decision, we weren't willing to ever to do. Now, you know this. You know this truth in your own life. You can verify it because there are people here that you want to lose weight. There are people here that you want to do better at work. You, you, you want to relate better to your child or to your grandchild. And no matter how hard you've tried, you know, how much you've given or, or where you've worked, it's still not happened. And ultimately, the key difference is going to be for you to begin to, to lose weight or to get in better shape or, or to do better at work or to relate to that kid or that grandchild. Ultimately, it's going to be that you starting to do something that right up until that point, you weren't willing to do. And that's what we face as a church. That's what we face. You know, the truth, the truth is we can move towards a promised future with hope if we have the eyes to see it. If we can simply look through our fears and our anxieties about what could be. What could happen to us? What could happen to the church? To look through those things, to look beyond the challenges and the difficulties, to get a glimpse of what God calls us to, and in having that glimpse, move powerfully forward to the future. I believe in the promise of God, this blessing that he calls us to, a future with hope, not to harm us, but to prosper us. I believe in it, and I believe in that blessing, but I also believe as people of faith, there's a response that is required and that response is to act towards what we see. In 13 years, in 13 years from now, this church, for it to be vibrant, we're going to have to make a commitment to do things we're currently doing right now, but do them better. Maybe do them with excellence. In 13 years, we're going to have to realize that some of the things that we're doing today, that they may, maybe some things that we love, we'll have to do maybe a little differently. And that's true as individuals as well as the church. In 13 years, we're going to have to understand to be successful, to be a healthy, to be a vibrant church. Where it means we're going to have to probably embrace doing some things that we've never done before as a church. And ultimately, it might mean sometime in the next 13 years as a church, we decide to do something. We become willing to do something, some form of ministry, some thing that up until that point, we just weren't willing to do. You know, as you look back in the history of this church, all the wonderful celebrations that's happened in the life, you know, those are all easy things for us now. We look back 13 years ago to this building that we have in the addition, and we think, wow, that was wonderful. And we tend to forget, just like I forgot where I was 13 years ago. 
we, t- we tend to forget how difficult those decisions were then. How the fe- what the fears were, the anxieties, how much money it was going to cost. What, will people get mad about it? Will people leave? What if, what if we build it and we, we end up sinking the church? We forget about all those things. But this church in those moments has moved forward. Will we continue to move forward? Will you be a part of that? Will you see a future with hope? Will you receive that blessing from God, that promise of God, a future with hope? And will you see it enough that you can somehow see it through the difficulties and the challenges that you face today? See see beyond your fears and anxieties and take action towards that preferred future God has for us. Let's pray together. God, you're the wellspring of life. From you, all life and energy flow. From you, all good things come. You have promised your people, the people of faith, a future with hope. May by faith we see it. May we see it through our fears and our anxieties. May we see it beyond the actual difficulties and tragedies of life that sometimes we have to walk through. And in seeing that preferred future by faith, by your grace, may we take action towards it. Lord, I pray that you'd hear the calls and prayers of your people right now, some of which are praying not for the church right now, but for their own lives. Because while today I was preaching about the church, they heard a very personal message for them. They heard a message about change and the future. They heard a message about fear and anxiety and how they have to act today and really think about things and do things differently today in order to really live and have the different future that they want. And so, God, I pray you would receive the prayers of your people individually and collectively as a church that 13 years from today, we might live into that future of hope that you've promised. As individuals and as a church, may 13 years from now, Ringgold Methodist be the mission outpost of the kingdom of God that you intended to be. And so God, help us to do things we're doing now, but do them better. God, help us to do things that we're doing now, but do them differently as we need to. God, help us to do brand new things that we've never done before. And God, when the time comes, when it seems just impossible, help us to do the thing that right up until that moment we've been unwilling to do. But now it's time to do it. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and respond in song with us? I love this song. It has a lot of uh, terminology about time. God's faithfulness existing from the beginning all the way to the end. Would you sing with us?